Yes, glory to God. Well, let's stand up for just a minute. I'm going to tell you a couple of things, and then we're going to do something real quickly. First off, we had somebody ask us the other day. I know Dave was showing you the pictures of the poles. And we had somebody ask us, was it going to be safe in there when we remove those poles? Well, let me encourage you of this one fact. We're paying enough money that it's going to be safe in there when we remove those poles. They're just replacing the steel in a different direction. So uh, it's going to be doubly reinforced. It's going to be extra safe or we wouldn't make you go in there, you know, or anybody go in there. So it's going to, it's going to actually be safer is what they're telling us. So that's going to be a really good thing. So, uh, and then um, uh, BBC, um, I wanted to touch base with you on that. Every year it seems like that uh, we, uh, the Copelands, have everybody stand up or raise their hand that is from outside of our church. How many of you are here when that happens? Yeah, well, about 25 people are. And that's the point. You get the picture? Because everybody is not here. And so I encourage you. It is a rare thing for us to be able to have them... I don't know if you've looked at their calendar or not, but they have cut out most of their meetings. And we should be very, very grateful and very, very, very thankful to be able to have them coming here to Faith Life Church. And you know what? Brother Copeland, like Brother Hagen, won't always be around. And I am so thankful that we took the opportunity to receive everything from him that we could. And, you know, there's things that get imparted to you that you don't even know is getting imparted to you when you're in services like that. And you'll miss out on things if you're not in there yourself. Internet is great. And I know I've been having to watch by Internet a lot. But it ain't being there. It ain't being in the service. Because what happens when you're in the service sometimes is it will lead somebody in a totally different direction when they get in front of you than what they might have gone. And they may nail what's going on with you. I don't know what's going on with Tim, but I could just stand here and the Lord could direct me exactly what to teach on because of Tim sitting here tonight. And answer every question that he had. And that's what happens. And you may be praying for the answer to a question, and you may be praying and praying and praying, and God may say, go to that service, and that may be where your answer is. And you may pray about it another ten years, but unless you get in that service, you ain't going to get the answer. So I encourage you, be in the services. Do what you need to do to be there. Because we want to be where we need to be, when we need to be, get all the answers and all the supply that we need, right? Okay. Then the other thing is um, Miss Nancy has felt directed that she wants to be with her kids some and she wants to do a couple of other things. So I want you to stretch your hands out to her and let's pray. Pray this with me. Father God, in Jesus' name, we just ask you to have Miss Nancy exactly where you want her. When you want her, her. how you want her, her. to do exactly what you want her to do, do in your perfect will, will. and in your perfect place, place. because we love her, her. in Jesus' name. name. Amen. Amen. All right, and then one other thing, and then we're going to start preaching, and y'all can all stand and preach with me if you want to. Yeah. I told Keith I was going to tell you all that he was laying on the beach in Sarasota. But you know he's not. (laughs) He is up in Minneapolis where it is freezing cold. So uh, uh, we've prayed for him and his services are going extra well. So uh, just so you know where he is tonight, he's not laying on the beaches in Sarasota. And um, he's not goofing off. He's doing what he does, flying his airplane and preaching. So glory to God. All right, y'all ready to hook with me and we'll pray and then we'll go into the service. Father, in Jesus' name, we just ask you for your anointing tonight, Father. We just ask you for utterance from you, Father. We can do nothing, Father, except it be from you, Father. We ask you for your graces, your abilities 
abilities and your strengths, Father, that come from only you, from the throne of God. We thank you that you've given us things in the past, and we know that you'll not let us down tonight, Father. We ask you to give answers to questions and solutions to problems, and everyone be hooked and receive everything that they need tonight from your will and from your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And you can be seated. Glory to God. And y'all too. Well, I was so thrilled. This is a rare thing for me, as you know. Normally, I get a message about an hour before the service. And I actually got this message on the way home on the airplane last week. Because the Lord knew everything I had to do this week. And so... um, but it is a really exciting message for me, and I, I think you'll be really excited about it because it's a really encouraging message, and I think it's going to have lots and lots and lots of answers for you because I know it's got lots of answers, had lots of answers for me in it, and that's just the way God is. If He answers something for you, it applies to everybody around you. I don't know. Well, maybe my problems are different than yours. I don't know. You know, I don't have any problems, but, you know, maybe things that you deal with. I'll put it that way, or different than somebody else's. So put this scripture up for me, if you would, and then we're going to do something different. It's in the Message Bible. It's Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28. Read it with me. Are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me. Wait, wait, put the next one. Walk with me, and work with me. Watch what I do. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Verse 30. Keep company with me. And you'll learn to live freely and lightly. How you like that? That's pretty good, huh? You know, as I was reading that, I thought, I really like my Bible. How many of you love your Bible? I love my Bible. But you know what? My Bible is totally useless. Let me explain that to y'all. Are all looking at me like I'm going to pick up a stone and throw it at me now? (laughs) This Bible is totally useless without the person that stands behind it. It's like, have you ever read somebody's testimony or a biography about some great person that did great works for God? Say, have you ever read about Brother Oral or Brother Hagen, one of his books, you know? Have you ever read about T.L. Osborne or Smith Wigglesworth or John G. Lake or Amy Sibyl McPherson or any of those guys? What if you could take the time and they said, you know what? I'll come and I'll sit at your house with you. And Gary, I'll just sit there all day with you and I'll just talk to you and I'll tell you about all the exploits I've done for God. How would you like it? And then I'll pray for you and you can do the exact same thing. You can have the exact same anointing on you that I have on me. How would that be? Twelve people like it. <laughs> you must be like the person that invited Keith to their house that night. And um, uh, the lady, uh, the man invited. And then the lady found out that um, he invited Keith. And she comes up and she says, oh, no, you can't come to my house. We'll have to buy all new furniture. <laughs> so they took us to a restaurant. Not good. No, you should be willing to invite people in. But that's not my message. I'll go into something else. I'll get started on a different subject here. Uh, no, if, if 
Brother Oral or, or Brother Smith or, or T.L. Osborne or Brother Hagen said, you know what, I have it on my heart to come to your house and share with you what I've done. You should say, come on. I don't care if clothes is scattered everywhere. I don't care if it, the house is a mess. I don't care what's going on. That should be a priority to you. Because they're going to tell you about the things of God that happened. And you're going to receive things from them that you wouldn't have gotten another way. Turn with me, if you would, to Isaiah 55. And then this may be a totally different thing that you get to do tonight. So turn with me to this scripture and then we'll do something different. Isaiah 55, verse 1. Wait, this is the Amplified, I'm sorry guys, I've got about 62 different translations going on tonight, so y'all holler if it's not the one that I start reading. Wait and listen, everyone who is thirsty, come to the waters, he who has no money, come, buy and eat, yes, come, buy Priceless spiritual wine and milk without money, without price, simply for the self-surrender that accepts the blessing. Verse 2, why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your earnings for that which does not satisfy? Hearken diligently to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in fatness, the profuseness of spiritual joy. Incline your ear, submit and consent to the divine will, and come to me. Hear, your soul will revive, and I will make an everlasting covenant or league with you. Even the sure mercy and kindness and goodwill and compassion promised to David. Now let's sum it all up. Put the Living Bible up there if you would, verse 3. Because long reading sometimes, you don't get it all, but listen to this one. The Living. Let's see. Come to me with your ears wide open. Listen, for the life of your soul is at stake. I am ready to make an everlasting covenant with you to give you the unfailing mercies and the love that I had for King David. Now, does that explain it a little better? But what does it say we got to do? We got to come. And that's where the problem is. Today, everybody's got a gazillion questions. What do we do about this money? What do we do about this job? Where do we go to church? Where do we live? Where do we, uh, how do we fix this marriage problem? How do we fix our kids? Kids want to know, where do I go to college? Where do I find a girlfriend? Where do I find a friend? Where do I find a boyfriend? Parents want to know, how do I fix my kids? How do I fix my mom and dad? How do I fix my... Questions in every direction. And nobody has any answers. Everybody's looking for the right answer. What do we do to fix it? And the thing about it is, everybody is just exactly the same way as the whole outside world. What do we do to fix it? How do we fix it? Well, the thing about it is, we hear all of our lives come to Jesus. And it'll fix it. Come to Jesus and everything's going to be okay. Come to Jesus and all your problems are going to be solved. Come to Jesus and your life is going to be okay forever. How many 
haven't you been just a little bit disappointed that it didn't just change everything? <laughs> huh? <laughs> that the magic wand didn't just wave and you had a new house and a new car and all your bills were paid and your kids were just little angels. <laughs> I mean, because you thought that before you got saved, Right? But then when you got saved and you started living for God, it didn't just fix it. That's right. So what happened? Why didn't it fix it? You know me. I don't pull any punches. I'm just going to tell you the way it is. We don't have to lie in church. Either the Word works or we need to quit. Either God's good or He's not. I believe He is. I believe He'll help us. And I believe He has the answers. But we do got to come. He ain't mean. And He ain't holding out on us. How many of you in here are saved and you came to Jesus? I think that's a big part of the crowd. Turn with me to John 16, 12. This is the NIV, guys, who's ever in the back. Who's back there, Tara? Who am I torturing tonight? Who? Jane. Jane. Miss Jane. Thank you, Miss Jane, for being on your toes. This is the NIV, John 16, 12, and 13. Jesus is talking, and he says, I have much more to say to you, more than you can bear. Well, we already know that, verse 13. But when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only that he hears. But that next verse, that next part, read with me. Wait a minute. Read it again. He's a fortune teller. He will tell you what is yet to come. He's going to tell you how to fix your problems. Now, was Jesus a known liar? Did he lie? Did he have a reputation for lying? So if Jesus says that the Spirit within us will do what? He will tell us things to come. Will he? How many of you just... Being honest here on a daily basis, kind of been getting the right answers on things to come. Ain't just all the time just been happening. If it had been, you'd know where to put your money in the stock market. You'd know what to do with your kids. You'd know why you couldn't pay your light bill this month. You'd know why your husband hadn't talked to you in three days. Huh? Huh? Why aren't we getting these answers? What did he say we had to do? He said we had to do something. He told us we had to come. Come. Now we have... A perfect God, a perfect Jesus, a perfect Bible, perfect salvation, perfect redemption. But he created an imperfect man. Now, does that make sense to you? Does that sound like God? Turn to Genesis. What did he say? 
Genesis cha uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 31. God, this is the NIV. God saw all that he had made and it was very good. Look at your spouse and tell them they're very good. Yeah, look at your neighbor and tell them you're very good. Yeah, very good. In spite of what you look like and feel like. Or what you did this morning or this afternoon? Or what your thoughts were five minutes ago? You are very good. No matter what the devil got on your shoulder and told you, you are very good. And it's time we quit siding in with the devil. And in case you're wondering, verse 27, God created man. So that was before verse 31. So you were included in that very good. So that means you are... Say it. I am very good. Say it some more. I am very good. Say it again. I am very good. Say it again. I am very good. God doesn't create anything bad. Say it again. I am very good. Doesn't matter how bad the devil told you you were. You am very good. Because God can't lie and Jesus can't lie, so you am very good. I don't care if you stole something today, if you beat your wife today, if you hit your neighbor today, if you wrecked your car today, if you... I don't care what you did today. You can change, and you am very good. Because that's who God created, and He only creates good things. So you am very good. Right? One more time. I am very good. I don't care what I did today, or yesterday. Or the day before? I am very good. God only creates very good. And that's me. That's who you are. Very good. You're not a failure. You're not a mess up. You're not a mistake. I don't care what your mom and dad told you. You're very good. And Jesus doesn't lie. And God doesn't lie. So you're very good. All right? Are we settled on that or we need to say it some more? Let's say it again. Because I know how many times the devil told you you wasn't. Say, I am very good. God created me. He only creates very good. He created me. Therefore, Therefore, I am, I am very, good. very good. Now, the next time the devil sits on your shoulder, or the next time you mess up, as soon as you mess up, you remember Keith's story about the cigarettes and smoking? That's right. right? As soon as you mess up, you start saying, uh uh, 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 I'm very good. Mr. Devil, maybe I did that five seconds ago, but I'm very good. That's who I am. I'm very good. Okay? Ephesians 4.13. Here is where the problem comes in. You want to know why when you got saved... I know you asked me the question. I could see it in your eyes when I said it a while ago. When you got saved, everything didn't just get fixed, right? When you got saved, all your bills didn't get paid. And you didn't lose all the weight you wanted to lose, and your hair didn't just fall into place like it was supposed to, and all the glorious things that everybody convinced you was going to happen when you got saved. Right? That your whole world full of problems was just going to go away, and there was never going to be another one when you got saved. Huh? 
Huh? You had a problem since you got saved? You had to deal with anything since you got saved? You had to overcome anything since you got saved? Don't look at me like you hadn't. You live in this world. And you have to face crazy people. And some of them you wanted to slap. But here's why. This is the Amplified. Ephesians 4.13. That it might develop until we all attain oneness in the faith and in comprehension or understanding of the full and accurate knowledge of the sons of God that we might arrive. That means... You ain't got there yet, sister. That means uh, we might arrive. That means we're going somewhere. That means we're on our way to something. That means we're on a trip. That we might arrive at the mature manhood, the completeness of personality. That's why you ain't got no personality yet. So if somebody tells you that personality is no good, tell them, I'm working on it. Give me some time. I'm going to arrive there. I'm getting there. Which is nothing less than the standard of height of Christ's own perfection. The measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ and the completeness found in Him. What happened when you got saved was, you got saved. You don't got to go to hell. You should stand up and run and rejoice because you don't got to go to hell. It's a bad place. I know it's been cold here lately. But it can get really hot. But you ain't felt hot till you got to go to hell and live there for eternity. It's a bad place. And people joke about it and they make fun about it. But when you got to live in a burning fire forever, you can't even stand in your kitchen if you don't have air conditioning with the stove burning or the oven burning. How many of you's air conditioning's ever gone out? Were you glad when you got it back? It can get hot. And you try to get dressed and your makeup all runs and you ha- the guys makeup all runs. But it can get hot. And it's a bad thing. But what we are supposed to do is thank God we don't have to go to hell. That's what happens when we get saved. But that is not the end. That is the beginning. That is first grade. That is preemie school. That's the beginning. then what people try to do is they try to... uh Uh-oh, I better go someplace where I can get away from everybody. So they can't throw anything at me. Pretend like they know everything. And that they have all the answers when they've been saved a year. This may... Will be 30 years Keith and I have been living for the Lord. And I don't know nothing like I should know. 30 years we've been sitting in services twice a day, three times a day, five classes a day with some of the world's best teachers. And I feel like I know nothing. 
much less someone who comes and sits even through one of Keith's services on a Sunday for an hour or two (laughs) or Friday three. We shouldn't pretend because what happens when we pretend God can't help us. And we hurt ourselves. And we've all done it. So we go through life as a failure. I'm going to tell you a story about some things that go on around here. And I'm not going to try to embarrass anybody, so I won't call any names. But Tom Hunter tells me all the time. (laughs) Mrs. Moore, didn't you know you don't drink out of plastic bottles? Mrs. Moore, didn't you know you don't like orange flowers? Mrs. Moore, didn't you know you don't like this? Mrs. Moore, didn't you know you don't like that? Mrs. Moore, didn't you know you don't do this? Mrs. Moore, didn't you know you don't do that? Mrs. Moore, don't you know that Brother Moore won't do it that way? Brother, Do you understand what I'm saying? Because somebody heard some little speck of something and filled in all the blanks around it and made up their own idea of what they thought. And it has nothing to do with the truth. But they made up their own concept of what they thought was the truth. And to make their self feel more important, they told it to somebody else. Which made it even worse. And then when that somebody else came and looked at them like they knew something and asked them questions, they had to make up what they didn't know. That's what's happening in the body of Christ. People are coming and they're getting a little bit, getting enough to hurt themselves. Then they're going home and they're filling in the blanks. And somebody asks them a question because they're hurting. And instead of saying, I don't know, let's get the Bible out and find out the answer. Or let's seek God about it. I'll pray with you. We'll ask God about it. Let's find out. I don't know. I don't have the answer. Let's find out. So we can have a victory. Which is more important? You looking good or somebody getting healed? Uh-uh. Uh-uh. That ain't what's happening. I'd like to say it was, but it ain't. The more important thing is you looking good. So how do we fix it? We got to grow up. We got to mature. We can't stay where we are and just be saved. And this book here means absolutely nothing without knowing the person behind it. My staff I, especially since I have been gone, I have realized that an email or a text does not convey the same thing as me telling them something. And it can come across totally different. Look with me at a scripture here. First Samuel 25, verse 39. And guess what? It is the King James Version. So it has to be right. Verse, First Samuel 25, 39. King James Version. And when David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Bless the Lord. And he sit and commune with Abigail to take her for his wife. Glory to God. Did you get it? I skipped a few parts. But that's the gist of it. It's my version of it. When David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Bless the Lord. 
It's pleased the cause of my reproach and uh, the hand of Nabal that's kept his servant from evil. And the Lord has returned the wickedness from Nabal upon his head. And now David sent and communed with Abigail to take her to him to wife. Now you're good and confused and I'm glad. First Kings chapter 10 verse 1. King James Version again. And when the queen of Sheba, that's not all the women in here. Heard of the fame of Solomon. Skip down to verse 2. She came to prove him with some hard questions. She came to Jerusalem with lots of stuff. She communed with him of all that was in her heart. Verse 3, and Solomon told her all her questions. There was nothing, not anything hid from the king, which he told her not. How do we find out what God wants? How do we hear from him? What do we have to do? We come. We get saved. Then we stop. We go to church on Sunday. And we hope that maybe the preacher will tell us something that will help us today. And that's all we have to do. Because it's his job to hear from God for us. And that's what solves all of our personal problems. Do you know that the Bible teaches that it is the minister or pastor's job to encourage you so that you can go out and encourage other people not to fix your problems? See, nobody but five people over here shook their heads because I was looking directly at them. That's the only reason they shook theirs. Read the Bible, see? We have decided that we don't have to... Let me read you what commune means. In the Hebrew, it says, To arrange words, to speak, rarely in the destructive sense, to subdue something, but to bid, commune, declare, uh, to give, to promise, to pronounce, to rehearse, to say... To speak, to teach, to tell, to think, to utter. Commune, if you put it into one other word, it means fellowship. If you commune with someone, you fellowship with that person. Let me give you another story here. Years ago, I'd tell you how many years, but you'd know how old I was, and that wouldn't do. No, I don't care. But anyway, um, we went to a meeting of the Copelands. It was right after we got saved. And we sat in the back of the auditorium, kind of midway. They happened to find us the tape of it. And it was, happened to be the tape that they used. We just found this out. It was just such a blessing to us. That particular meeting that we were in way back years ago happened to be their very first TV broadcast. Isn't that something? Uh, so they sent it to us. And, uh, but anyway, we sat in that meeting. And Brother Kenneth and Miss Gloria did not know we existed. Can you believe that? They didn't know we existed. And years went by. And we listened to them. And we listened to everything that they had, day after day and night after night and day after day and night after night. 
And we learned about them. We learned their stories and we learned things about them. We could tell you stuff about them. They might not have known about themselves. We listened to them so much. But they still didn't know who we were. So years went by. We went to Ramah. Same thing happened there. We went into a big crowd, an auditorium bigger than this one. Keith sat in the crowd somewhere. Brother Hagin didn't know he existed from anybody. But he went. And he kept going. There was no communing our fellowship with either one of them. Zip, zip, none. But time went on. And we stayed in our place and we kept listening and we kept doing things. And as things happened, little things would happen to where we would be around them just a little bit. Here and there in a service. I remember, I remember the first day I met Brother Hagen. I'm sure I made an impression on him because he shot English peas at me. <laughs> but I didn't know him. And I remember the first time we met Brother Kenneth. Hi, how are y'all? That was it. But he didn't know us. But if you would have said... Do you know them? Have you met them? We could have said yes. And the same thing happens with you. Do you know Jesus? Have you met him? How well do you know him? About as well as we knew Brother Hagen or Brother Copeland at the time. About this much. They might have recognized our face at that point. But they didn't know us. But years went by, and we continued to be around them. Night and day, we continued to be around the Hagans. We got to know the Hagans. We were with them from early morning till late night. We were with them when things were good and when things were bad. We were with them when the service was long and when the service was short. We were with them when we had to wear dresses 24-7. Yeah, that's why I don't wear dresses. But anyway, (laughs) we were with them. We learned the way that they liked this done and the way that they liked this done and the way that they liked this said and the way that they liked this put away and the way that they liked this folded and the way that they liked the car driven and the the way that they liked... Uh, the f- clothes folded in the way that they like the clothes ironed. I remember the very first time I ironed a piece of Mom Hagen's clothing and I burned it. I remember it explicitly. But we learned them. So much so that I had a key to their room and their house and their everything. We learned them. They knew who we were. I could tell you things about them. I knew what made them laugh. I knew what made them upset. Why? I spent time with them. Today, if I showed up in Fort Worth and I didn't have a place to stay, I would not mind at all picking up the phone, calling Brother Kenneth, saying, Brother Kenneth, I'm here in Fort Worth. I need to spend the night. We'll be there to get you. I remember one time I got in so much trouble with him because I rented a car and I came to his house and I didn't drive his car. I mean, I'm perfectly content walking in the house, going in, fixing my own coffee, fixing my own plate, taking... I like salads. Taking my own lettuce, taking my own stuff, doing what I want to do. Going in, plundering around, doing what I want to do. I would never have done that all those years ago when I was sitting in that crowd. I would have never called him and said, can I come spend the night at your house? He just said, are you a crazy woman or what? Miss Gloria would have said, you're whacked, woman. But do you understand what I'm saying? 
Why do we have that relationship with them? We spent enormous amounts of time with the both of them over years. Say it with me. No, you said it too fast. Years. Years. What do you spend the majority of your time doing? Hmm. Besides, I know you have to keep your job. But when you get done with your job, what do you spend the majority of your time doing? It's only your head. You're the only one that knows it. I can't read it. You got it? Everybody got it in their head? You are communing and fellowshipping with whatever that is. That's it. If it's the TV, whatever you love you fellowship with. And people stand and they yell from the rooftop, I love the Lord, I love the Lord, I love the Lord, I love the Lord! And they spend three hours with Keith on Friday and two hours on Sunday morning. What you love, you spend time with. What you love to do, you find time to do. Whether it's a computer, or a TV, or a golf. What you love to do, or work, in my case. Whatever it is. I mean, I love my husband, but that has been an issue. I have to stop doing so much to spend time with him. I tell you all my secrets. We all have them. You try starting two churches. And pastoring one and starting another one. You try it. You will give up something. But whatever you truly love, you will do. You will find the time to do it. Now ask yourself this question. How much do I truly love God? Be honest with yourself. He loves me. And he's never going to leave me. He's never going to forsake me. He's never going to turn his back on me. If I give him one stale minute, he's going to grab hold to it and help me any way he can. But whatever you love, you're going to spend time with. Now, in order to receive answers... Jesus told us something. What did he tell us? He would show us the things to come. Did he lie? Do you want to know the things to come? Do you get them from spending time with the other things that you love? Do we really, really, really want to mature and grow up and get the answers and see people healed and see our lives transformed and changed? Do we really, really, really want that problem fixed? How bad? Bad enough to change the thing that we love? See how quiet it got? 
The devil is a master of our senses. And he knows if he can keep us sense-oriented, he's got us. He's won. But we've got to flip the coin on him. Let's find out what God says how to hear from him. Do you want to? Here's some people. Genesis chapter 5, Amplified. You all know these. Enoch walked. Oh, sorry. Chapter 5, verse 24, Amplified. Thank you. My help's helping. Enoch walked with God. But what does it say before that in the Amplified up there? In habitual fellowship. For he was not, for God took him home with him. He walked with God continuously. He was always talking with God. He was always hearing from God. He was always fellowshipping with God. He always knew what God was thinking. He always knew what God was doing. He always wanted to be hearing from God. He always wanted his opinion. You get it? He always wanted to see what he had to say about the subject. Genesis 18:33. King James. And the Lord went his way as soon as he left communing with Abraham and returned into his place. I'll read these pretty quickly. Uh, You don't have to turn to them. Just look at the screen for just a minute if you want to. Genesis 24, verse 1 says, And Abraham was old, and he is well stricken in age. And the Lord blessed Abraham in all things. Now, you, you would just have to be... As Brother Hagin, you know, well, I won't say it because it doesn't bless anybody. But anyway, uh, you'd have to be dumb to not realize he was blessed with all things because he spent time communing with the Lord. And he knew what the Lord wanted. And this one blessed me, this next one, especially because of what we're doing. Exodus 25, verse 22 and 23 said, and I'm going to meet there with you. It's King James, and I will commune with you from the mercy seat, from between the two cherubs, which are, on, which are upon the ark of the testimony, of all things which I give thee in the commandment unto the children of Israel. And this 23 is what I like, especially right now. And thou shalt make a table of shittim wood, two cubits shall be the length thereof, and a cubit the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. We're constantly right now having to make decisions about what we're supposed to do. Where do we put this door? What do we do with this? What do we do with that? Are you having to make any decisions? Will he tell you the exact measurement of something you're supposed to do? No, he won't. He cared more about them in the Old Testament than he does you. Right? And he'll explain things better in the Old Testament than he will the New Testament. And he loved them more than he does you. Even though I'm his favorite, but anyway. So why can't he tell you exactly what to do? Why can't he give you the answer to fix that problem or that situation or to fix that sick child or to fix that deformed problem in your body or to fix whatever the situation is or to tell you how to quit doing the things you don't want to do and you keep doing can he I think he can but this is next part is why we don't get it because this is how 
most people commune. You want to know how most people commune? Luke 6. They were all filled with madness and commune with one another. Huh? Luke 6, 11, did I not tell you the verse? Sorry. Luke, 6, Luke 22, verse 4. And when he went his way the, and communed with the chief priests and the captains on how they could betray somebody. Jesus, of course, but they were communing with each other. At Luke 24, verse 15, and it came to pass, they communed together and reasoned. Now, let me ask you a question, and I just wonder how many honest people we have in here tonight. How many of you have had a problem or a situation? Let's not call it a problem. Nobody likes the word problem. Have had an issue or something you've had to deal with, and instead of going to God, you've gone to all your friends or everybody you know and asked them what they would do about it. Before going to God. Raise your hand. Some of you need to come right up here. Because you ain't growing. Because you've got to start with being honest with yourself. You don't reason with people to get the answer. They ain't got your answer. They ain't never going to have your answer. They can't hear from God for you. Jesus paid the price for you. When he went to hell and got the keys of of death, hell, and the grave, he did it for you. That victory wasn't for him. It was for you. And the things that he did was for you. And you don't have to go to anybody to hear from God for you. And nobody can fix your situation for you but you. Now, if you get something from somebody, it's because they got it from God. Because God had mercy on you because you were too ignorant to go to Him yourself. That's just the truth. Or you didn't do what He told you to do. And He had mercy on you. But God sent Jesus to die for you so that you could talk to Him directly for yourself. You don't have to have anybody to do it. You can do it for yourself. And you can get the answer completely for yourself. And you can mess it up for yourself. But you don't have to reason with anybody. Because, you know what? If I go to Gary and ask him for an answer, and I go to Jerome and ask for an answer, and I go to Kathy and ask for an answer, Every one of these people are going to give me a different opinion. Because you know why? I'm going to give every one of these people a different side of the story. We see it all the time. People tell us what they want us to know. And then they want us to answer what they want us to want to hear. And how are we supposed to tell them anything unless it's just straight from God? But God has all the answers. And he can fix your problem lickety-split. It doesn't take him long. He can fix it before you can bat your eyes. And he wants to. And he's full of mercy and he's full of grace. And he said, wait, let's find it. I don't want to say something he didn't say. Um, He says, I will make a covenant, an everlasting covenant with you and give to you all the unfailing mercies and love that I had for King David. Now, King David was perfect. And he never messed up. He never did anything wrong, so that's why he could have all those mercies and all that good stuff, right? Absolutely not. He messed up. So you're in a good place. If he did it for him, he'll do it for you. 
He said, I will make an everlasting covenant with you and I will give you all the unfailing mercies that I had for King David. Wait a minute. Say it. I am very good. God only creates very good. And that's me. I am very good. You were forgetting that, weren't you? You are very good. And so you did talk to somebody. And so you did mess it up. Hey, I'm very good. Don't let the devil do that to you. You messed up. That was the past. Even though it was 30 seconds ago. Right? You are very good. Say it again. I'm very good. God only creates. Very good. And I am very good. Look at your neighbor. Tell him. You are very good. God only creates. You're not looking. You hate it as much as I do, but do it anyway. They need to hear it. Love somebody enough to do it for them. God God. only creates creates. very good. good. And you you are very very good. I don't care if they slapped you before you came to church. You tell them they're very good. Because that's who God said they were. And if they'll start to believe that, that's who they will be. Because that's who God created. Let's look at this. If God created a perfect human, a perfect word, a perfect Bible, a perfect salvation, a perfect way, then He created a perfect way for you to communicate with Him. And a perfect way for you to be able to hear from Him. And there ain't no devil in hell big enough to stop it. And you can hear from him. If he says believers will lay hands on the sick and they will recover, how long do you have to be saved to be a believer? Huh? A believer can lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Then I would think you could be able to hear from God when you get saved. Because what if somebody had terminal cancer? You as a believer should be able to lay hands on them and they should be able to recover if you just got saved five seconds ago. But it's just because we as Christians have not taken our place and stood where God told us to stand. Because we don't believe we're very good. We believe what the devil tells us. And it don't take much for him to convince us that we're not very good. But don't ever let anything else come out of your mouth. But that you are very good. He paid a very valuable price for you to be very good. That's the whole point of you being saved. So that you can say, oh God, I messed it up again, I messed it up again. But I'm very good. Glory to God. Thank you for your mercy. I ask you to help me to never do that again. Hallelujah. And that's about how long it takes for you to be very good again. If you mean it and you change it. But the church as a whole has been beat over the head that they're just very bad. And that's the way they live, as very bad. But we're not, guys. We're very good. And we do very good things. So let's find out how us as very good people can hear from our very good Father. All right? You need answers? How many in here could use an answer tonight about something? All right, let's hear. Psalms 4, verse 3 and 4. This is the King James, the Holy King James. I'm not making fun of the King James if somebody's in here that... Keep your stones. I'll go stand behind the wall again. (laughs) 
Psalm verse 4. Psalm chapter 4, verse 3. But know that the Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. Stand in awe and sin not. Commune or fellowship with your own heart upon your bed and be still. How do you commune with God? Huh? Let's hear the NIV. Know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. Say, that's me. I'm very good. And I'm godly. The Lord will what? 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 He don't hear you. Huh? Then why don't you have the answer? Because you don't hear him. Verse 4, in your anger do not sin when you're on your beds. Search your hearts and be silent. What does that mean? You ever laid in your bed at night and said things you shouldn't have said? Said things you wished you wouldn't have said? That ain't talking to God. That's being mad. That's being mad at the other person and thinking bad thoughts about somebody else. Let me read verse 77, then I'll tell you this. Uh, Psalm 77, verse 6. I call to remembrance my song in the night... And I commune with my own heart and my spirit made diligent search. My husband and I have been together almost 40 years. That's a day or two. Now, I know one or two things about him. And the other night we were in Sarasota and we came in the house and I said, you know what, you ought to try this. It's really, really good. You ought to try this. And he said, that is really good. And then he told me, you ought to do this. You're really going to enjoy it. And, And when we came in that night, we both said, you know, we do know each other by now a little bit. Because we both enjoyed both of the things that we said. But you know, when we were 13 years old, I know I've got parents in here with 13 year olds. When we were 13 years old, we didn't know all that stuff about each other. But now, he knows everything about me, and I know everything about him. Everything. Everything. I know what kind of airplane he likes, yeah. If you can imagine that. I know what time he likes to go to bed. I know what time he likes to get up. I know what he likes in his coffee. I know what time, what he don't like in his coffee. I know what if he likes, if he wants coffee now. I'll know what he wants to drink at the dinner table. I know what he likes to eat. I'll think of what he wants to eat before he thinks of what he wants to eat. I know where he wants to go. I know what he wants to do. He's the same way with me. Valentine's Day, he wakes up and he says, come on. He takes me for a fly in the airplane over where we can see all the snow. And he says, look, look, see, those, see this, babe? Just to see little things. He had to fly the airplane and do some other stuff. And so he said, come, come look at this on the way. He said, now how many women got a private airplane flight for Valentine's Day? But you, you know what they like. But do you know what? I would have never, ever, 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 never, ever, 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 never, ever, never, ever learned what he liked if I wouldn't have shut up. And listened. And quit complaining. God, he 
it just won't change. It won't change. What's the deal? You don't care. What, what are we going to do? Why are we going to fix it? How are we going to change this? What are we going to do? Where's the problem? All night long. That ain't communion. My husband would leave the room. He'd say, what's going on? Get in faith. We're, 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 what? Get some faith here. Hey, hey, hey. Did you lose your salvation? <laughs> and that's really what God should say to us. We are saved now. And we have to take steps to growing up. But there's certain things that you know in your heart when you're doing them. You shouldn't be saying and shouldn't be doing. But God has the answers for us on how to fix even our mess-ups. Isn't that good? He fixed David's. And if he's merciful to David, he'll be merciful to you. But he says, come to me and commune with me and I'll give you the answers. If you love somebody, you'll do what? You'll spend time with them. If you love the Lord, you'll spend time to him. You know why people don't spend time with the Lord? He's not active enough for them. He's not moving enough for them. They're wanting something that's going to do something to these senses. And he's spiritual, and they're carnal. And the only way you're going to hear from him is getting still and getting quiet and zipping the lip. And saying, God, I don't know it. If I'd have known it, I'd already fixed it. I'm going to shut up now. And I'm going to ask you, God, help me fix this. I'm just going to lay here and worship you and say, thank you, Lord. I love you. I love spending time with you. I'm just going to lay here and listen to you. Thank you, Lord. I love you. I worship you. It's so good to spend time with you around your throne. You're such a wonderful God. You do so many wonderful things for me. I just can't thank you enough. And when you run out of things you can say in English, what do you got? You got the Spirit. And you just lay there and you just worship Him. And you know what? The wonderful thing about praying in the Spirit is your mind is what? So He can be talking to your mind too. And you can just, and you don't have to be yelling and you don't have to be screaming. And you can just lay there in a peaceful rest. And He can be talking to you all night long. And you know what? Some of you need to talk to him more than you need to sleep. Because if you got to talking to him, it'd fix your problems and your sleep would be good. But you got to get quiet. And you got to listen. Because what did it say back here? Let's see. It said, in John 16, He will tell you what is yet to come. So, we need to decide if this Bible and God and Jesus are liars And we're serving liars? Or if it's the truth? And we're the ones messing up. We're the ones doing something wrong. It's time we spend time with the one we truly love. Do we truly love the TV? Or do we truly love the computer? Or do we truly love that game? Or do we truly love whatever the situation is in your life? Or do we truly love God? And do we truly want it fixed? Or do we truly love our spouses? Got to decide what's most important to us. Because if we don't fix that, 
We can't do the job that God's called us to do. Which is what? Do you know you and 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 you? Let's see. There's probably a thousand people in here. Every person in this room has a ministry. But you know what? You can't do it if you don't get you fixed because you ain't got nothing to give except for bitterness and hardness and meanness. And, and if you don't truly believe that this is true yourself, how are you ever going to convince somebody else? If your bills aren't paid and your kids are a mess and you can't talk to God yourself, how are you ever going to convince somebody else that God is true and love and He loves you? You can't. Look at me with me at 2 Corinthians 5.18. The NIV, please. All of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave who? Who is us? Raise your hand if you're an us. Some of you are not raising your hand. Raise your hand if you're an us. Okay, some of you are still not raising your hand, so I don't know what you are. Maybe a monkey, I don't know. But anyway, gave unto us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. Say, because I'm very good. And He has committed to us the message of reconciliation. What reconciliation means is restoration of favor. That's what we are supposed to be ministering to other people. You can be restored into God's good graces. You can be restored into His favor. It doesn't matter what you've done, how you've messed up. How are you going to minister that to somebody else when you don't believe it yourself? So guys, we've got to grow up. We've got to spend time talking with the one that we love. We've got to let Him know. I know from my own personal experience... The Word is wonderful. Texts are wonderful. Emails are wonderful. But it's nothing like looking my staff in the eyes and saying, I love you. It's not like a text or an email. God will get in your bed with you and He'll wrap His arms around you and He'll tell you He loves you and He'll give you the answers to your questions and He'll solve all your problems for you. But you've got to come. And you've got to commune with Him. That's how we grow up and become The perfect man in Christ. We don't get that way the day that we're saved. We grow that way and we arrive to that point by spending time with Him. The first verse that we read, are you tired? Are you tired of religion? Are you tired of all these things? That's why people get tired of religion. Because they don't know Him. And they're not getting their answers. We don't want to be a bad witness for God. Because it's not Him that's the problem. It's us not spending time with Him. He's there with His arms wide open saying, Come. Just the same way He did the day that you were saved. He's telling you tonight, Come. Come talk to me. Come. Come spend time with me. If you love me, spend time with me. How do you feel about your kids? Do you love it when they come spend time with you? Husbands and wives, how do you like it when your spouse wants to spend time with you and just sit there and listen to you? No matter what you're talking about, even if it's airplanes. They just want to be with you. It brings joy to your face. It brings joy to your being. That's the way our Father God is. And you do that, He'll give you answers, He'll give you light, He'll solve every situation that's in your life. You won't need to look for anybody else to fix your problems for you. He's already fixed them. You just got to find out what to do in order to receive what he's done for you. Stand up with me. (laughs) 
Do not let the devil condemn you. Jesus paid the most horrible, horrible price for you to be convinced that you are very good. If you've got to put it up in signs on your windshield, on your car, on your mirror, on your refrigerator, on your TV where you spend most of your time, I am very good. Do it. And spend time with the one who loves you and gave that for you so that you can receive the answers. Then we won't be defeated. We won't be going down the tube like the whole rest of the world. We'll receive everything that we're supposed to receive of him. I've asked the guys to sing a song for us. Are y'all ready to do it? Go ahead then, Matt. Fellowship, what a joy divine. I am his and he is mine. Condemnation interrupt our faith. Condemnation is from the devil and it is designed to keep you separated from the love of God. If you don't know God, you are already condemned. And if you know God, the devil's trying to get you condemned. He's trying to get you in a place you can't receive, you can't commune, you can't fellowship with Him. So whatever's been going on in your life, everybody bow your heads, close your eyes. doesn't matter what's been going on, what you've been doing, what's been happening. God's a good God, and you are good. And if you don't know God, or you do know God, you know God, and you've been condemned, you've been doing things you ought not been doing, and you know it, and you want to come clean, and you want to come close with Him, and you want to do it publicly and openly before all to say, He's my Lord, and I trust Him. Or you don't know God, and you want to come forward tonight and publicly proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord of your life tonight. I'm going to open the altars tonight. And as they're singing this song, everybody leave your heads bowed and your eyes closed. But if you want to just come forward, rededicate your life, make Jesus Christ Lord of your life, as they sing, come. Don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed. It doesn't matter if you've been saved 30 years, but you feel the Lord's telling you to come forward tonight to to make a new start, to make a clean, fresh start, or to, to make Him Lord first time. As they sing, come. Glory to God. Fellowship, what a joy divine. I am His and He is mine. I commune with Him all the time in fellowship. Father God, He is to me. Righteous child, I'm made. I am 
Glory to God. There's no better time. If you just want a fellowship, you just want to commune, you want a, you want a fresh start tonight, I'm going to let them keep singing because I still believe there's people out there that would like to come forward. There's something telling you you don't. That's pride. There's no reason to hold on to that. That will keep you from God's best. There's no reason to do that. Let's sing it some more. Encourage yourself in the Lord. Come on down and, and get that fresh start. Get that, get that. Make Jesus Christ Lord of your life. Don't leave here with a question in your heart, should I have come? Go ahead and come. Glory to God. All you're going to get from us is cheers. Glory to God. Sing it some more. What a joy divine. Fellowship today. He broke down the walls that stood between the Father and me. And since He rose from hell, I can go. today you broke down the walls that stood between the Father and me since he rose from hell I can go behind the veil to fellowship yes I can I can bed at night and not fellowshipping, but contemplating suicide. Heads bowed and eyes closed, if you would please, for just a minute. This is a good life. God is a good God. He loves you. And He has made a way for you. I don't care how embarrassing it is. I don't care how hurtful it is. I don't care how the devil is pulling on you. I don't care what your husband is going to think. I don't care what your wife is going to think. You need to break that spirit off of you now and get down here to the altar now. There's people all over this place, and and I know because I just stood there and saw it. Come down here as quickly as you can. I'm not going to pray for you. Nobody needs to pray for you. You need to come up here and make it right with the Lord. And there are people in here like that. There's people watching by the Internet that's the same way. Heads bowed, please, and eyes closed. Nobody needs to see who's up here at the altar. This is between them and God. If it's you, come down here, please, quickly. Don't let the devil convince you of that. That is a lie from the pit of hell. There are people in here. Don't be embarrassed by it. Come on down. Yeah, they're coming from every direction. Don't Come on down. Keep your heads bowed and eyes closed. Don't look. This is between them and God. There are more. 
Do not let the devil tell you that lie. Your life is valuable. You have a call. You have things that you're supposed to do. There's some young people in here. You should be down here. There's some other older people in here. You have thought those very thoughts and you've laid in your bed and said, God, I wish I was dead. If that's you, do not play with this. It's very serious stuff. As Keith's been teaching us, our words are very serious. Come down here and by doing that, you take and break the devil's bands completely off your mind and your thoughts. And he will, God's grace will be there to help you the next time that situation arises. Father, I just pray for each and every person that's in this room that the devil has lied to with that. And I just ask you to give them the grace now to step forward and do what the devil is telling them that they cannot do. Everybody pray. Father, I just ask you that your hand be strong upon them now that they're able to do this and take any authority that the devil has tried to put in their lives away from him in Jesus' name. I see people crying all over this place, so I know God's moving on you. Come down. Take a step out. Don't let the devil have that power in your life any longer. Thank you, Lord, for your mercies, for those standing back in their seats that the devil has lied to already, and they don't even feel strong enough to come forward. I ask you to minister to them where they stand, Father. Have compassion and mercy upon them. Give them the ability to stand one more day, one more hour. Because of your graces and your mercies. Give them the answers as they call upon you tonight, upon their beds. It's not too late. It's not too bad. Things can change in an instant. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Sing it again. Thank you, Lord. Fellowship, what a joy divine. I am His, and He is mine. I commune with Him all the time in fellowship. Father God, He is to me. to God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You know, we could close up and just leave here right now. And that would be good with several people who still haven't come down yet. But the Lord wants to give you more opportunity. The Lord's having mercy on you. He wants to give you more opportunity to come forward. And because 
if he says come forward, it's not so people can see it. It's because he wants you to do it. Do it as an act of obedience, of willingness to know that he's a good God and that he's got good answers for you and that you don't have to deal with these things, these thoughts, these lies from the devil, but that you can be made free. So everybody, keep your head bowed, your eyes closed, pray in the Spirit, sing with the band, do whatever it is, but believe God for yourselves, for others that are in this room, for people watching by Internet. Believe God as we sing this through some more. It's not too late. Come on forward. Come on forward and just commune with God. Go ahead, Matt. Let's pray for those watching on the internet because they they can't be here, but this anointing is there. So, Father, we pray in the name of Jesus that those that are being bothered by the deception of the devil, those lies that have told them that they, they just ought not even be on this earth, the condemnation, Lord, we pray in the name of Jesus that they find your love and that they know your mercy, that they see your goodness, and that the lies of the devil become clear to them that they are just that, their lies. And we bind up those lies off of them in the name of Jesus, and we pray for clarity of mind and that their heart would be open to receive and hear from you, that there, that the communication, the communing with you would be free and open and that they would know that they are good and that you created them good and that you have a good plan for their life and that nothing can stop that plan and no devil in hell can keep them from completing the work that you have for them to do. Nothing they've done will stop it. Nothing they will ever do will stop it because you're a good God and you love them, Lord. We pray that they know that love in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Well, it's been a good night. Guess what we ought to do when we go home? Fellowship. That's when you can really fellowship. Amen? Just you and God. You won't have nobody looking around at you, talking to you, right? You can lay across your bed. You can get quiet. You can hear from God. And if you're like me, you'll have to practice that. Right? Y'all aren't like me. Your, your mind don't go 90 to nothing when you get in bed or lay down and get quiet for a minute, does it? you got to practice being quiet. So tonight, take this message home with you. You've got it in your heart now. You've got it in your heart. So take it home with you and get quiet and hear from God. He's got answers. A lot of you know that you now can go get an answer. You've been sitting there saying, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. You don't need to say that anymore. Now you can go home and get an answer. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Sunday morning, we'll be back, 9 and 11. You guys going to be excited? You better be. Brother Moore's been preaching, so he'll have a lot more preach in him. Amen? Yeah. Yeah, Brother Moore will be here, 9 and 11, so he'll, he'll be ready to roll. Glory to God. All right. They'll sing. We'll be dismissed as they do. Love you all.